I have a friend in the ministry who was once asked, does it bother you when people sleep during your sermons? And he said, no, I always just think, well, sleep is a great gift from God and at least I can give them that. <laughs> so if at uh, 3.45 on an afternoon of a long day you feel a little uh, drowsy, uh, that's okay. I'll try to stay awake, but um, you all find what blessing is most appropriate at this moment in your life. Now I have another great title. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> and you have no idea really how exciting it is to write part two when you don't know what's in part one. <laughs> I said last night to Sinclair that I hope what I say is complimentary or at least contradictory and not just redundant and uh, thankfully that's the case the complimentary part so for the next 45 minutes I'll just be complimentary of uh, Sinclair and uh, all of the wonderful work that he does well we will go on to consider how we interpret the Word of God and I would like you to turn with me uh, to 2nd Timothy chapter 2 which may mean I should have been part one and he part two, but nonetheless, uh, 2 Timothy chapter two, looking at those verses from which the uh, title rightly dividing comes, uh, reading verses 14 through 16. I'd like to say normally in our church we read about a chapter of scripture before the sermon, so uh, uh, we also uh, regularly in the Dutch Reformed tradition read the Ten Commandments each uh, uh, Sunday morning and uh, our former pastor who was traveling around the country had a rather inex interesting experience. He went into a church and the sermon was on how the Ten Commandments ought to hang in courtrooms and classrooms of the land. And as our pastor went out, he shook the minister's hand and said, well, that was an interesting point. Uh, I'll have to ponder that, but I am curious, why don't you read the Ten Commandments in your church? You're free to do that. I thought that was a rather clever comment, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Those of you who are awake can explain it to the rest. Um, <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2 at verse 14. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Be a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles, or as the King James put it, rightly divides the word of truth. This uh, word translated uh, correctly handles or rightly divides is a word that appears only once in the New Testament. And it is a compound word meaning to cut straight. And uh, in the Septuagint, it's used in Proverbs 3, verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your ways straight. To make straight to use the Word of God to make things straight and to approach in a straight way the Word of God. And that challenge reminds us that there are many ways in which the Word of God is misused, leading the workman to be ashamed of what he's done, and that the Word of God has to be handled carefully, responsibly, thoughtfully by those who read it and those who preach it. And the Word of God, as we've already been seeing, while perspicuous in its great central message of salvation, is not always immediately and easily clear to us. The doctrine of perspicuity, as we've seen, does not mean that every verse is perfectly clear to every Christian all the time. Far from it. <clears throat> 
And Jesus himself reminded us of that. John 16, verse 25, Jesus said to his disciples, though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. Jesus a number of times talked about the indirect way in which he was communicating that led to some confusion. And indeed, referring to the Old Testament, Jesus in Matthew 13, 13 said to his disciples, this is why I speak to them in parables, because as the scripture said, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. So there are times in which the scripture is not clear, sometimes because of failings in us, sometimes because of failings in the preachers or the teachers, not all teachers of the word or those who proclaim themselves to be teachers of the word are reliable. Paul warned us about that in a number of places. He said of himself, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. We just did the question and answer se se session. We're talking about those who peddle the word for profit and the danger that can come from that. Paul further says in 2 Corinthians, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. But this alerts us as Christians that there are those who distort the word of God and who are deceptive. Paul warned the Ephesian elders, you remember, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. They want to create disciples of themselves rather than disciples of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so there are those who are deliberately setting out to preach the lie rather than the truth and to distort the word of God. They are the followers of the father of lies. But in 2 Timothy, Paul also suggests that there may be people who are true followers of Jesus Christ who are very well-meaning, but nonetheless may become ashamed of what they've done if they don't handle the word carefully, correctly rightly. These are people who are incompetent in one way or another in their handling of the word. And interestingly, uh, Calvin uh, in his famous treatise replying to Satellito commented that this is true of all Christians at all times. So we ought to be a little bit uh, humble at this point and recognize that all of us at times have been incompetent in our handling of the text and have said things of which uh, one day, if not already, we are ashamed. Calvin wrote, I admit that pious and truly religious minds do not always attain to the mysteries of God, but are sometimes blind in the clearest matters. The Lord doubtless so providing in order to accustom them to modesty and submission. That is part of why we need each other. We can be blind in the clearest matters. And so we need help from one another in looking into the word. Uh, this is why, in spite of the fact that there are dangers to education, uh, Christians through the centuries have always insisted that education be viewed more as a friend than as an enemy of the faith. Good education, solid education, responsible education. Um, that part of the way in which we can make progress in rightly handling the word of truth is to become better educated. And so we have seminaries that work at training people in the knowledge of the Bible. Good seminaries teaching future ministers in Greek and Hebrew and in theology and in history and in knowledge of the text of scripture so that they can handle the word correctly and not be ashamed. But interesting, if you get catalogs of most good seminaries, what you'll find is that those seminaries also recommend a course of education before you come to seminary. And in that recommended course of study, there are usually courses recommended like history, philosophy, and literature. Now, why is that? Why can't we just go right to seminary and study the Bible? Why should we be delayed and distracted by all of these other kinds of studies? Because the wisest through the history of the church, I think, have correctly said that in order to study the Bible responsibly and carefully and correctly, you first have to know how to read. That doesn't seem too difficult a case to make. 
But they extend that and say, not only do you have to know how to read, but you know, you need to, it's very profitable to know how to read literature. Because in one sense, at least, we have to say that the Bible is literature. It is God's word, but it's God's word given through human authors. It's God's word in human words. It's God's word written in a particular human language at a particular time in history, in a particular style of writing. And the better equipped we are to understand the way various kinds of literature work and the way various cultures work, the better we'll be prepared to read the Bible and understand it. If the Bible is the only book we've ever read, it'll be much harder to understand how the language of the Bible works than if we have a broad familiarity with literature and writing and know how language works in different settings. And so in this Rightly Dividing the Word Part 2, we're not going to look at all the ways in which we can profit from study in being better interpreters of the Bible, but I want to look at you particularly with some of the issues that arrive out of literature and language and style that help us in understanding the message of the Bible more correct, correctly and handling it in ways that will not lead us to be ashamed. And we want to begin by looking at some of the genre of the Bible. Now, um, one of the uh, interesting things I've always observed is that part of the way the scholarly cast in our society protects itself from prying eyes is to use absolutely unnecessarily arcane and preferably foreign words to describe what they're doing. Uh, French uh, genre is the French word for kinds. But you see, if you talk about the genre of the Bible, instead of the kinds of writing in the Bible, you sound a lot smarter. And uh, since this is a fairly smart group, at least the ones of you awake, we'll uh, continue to talk about genre instead of uh, just kinds. Well, it doesn't take very much acquaintance with the Bible to know that there are different kinds of writing in the Bible, does it? Uh, we see that there are historical accounts in the Bible. And Sinclair, I think it was, talked about how that covenant history in the Bible has a particular lens to it, a particular focus, a particular character. It is real history recounting real events, but it does it with a particular purpose in mind. Uh, so the history of the Bible does have a particular literary shape to it, and the more that we understand that shape, the better off we are. For example, sometimes people say, well, the Gospels are the biographies of Jesus Christ. And that's true and not true. It's true that the Gospels give us real events in the life of our Lord, but if they were submitted to a publisher as a biography, they would be judged significantly deficient. There are years and years of his life about which we know nothing. We're never given a physical description of our Lord. Now, some of us are quite confident that he was relatively short. <laughs> but we're not actually told that for certain. Um, no, the... the, the the gospel writers are not interested in all sorts of questions that we would normally like to have answered uh, in a good biography. Because the history of the gospels is not a biography, it's a presentation of the great saving work and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're going to understand its language, we have to understand uh, that character. Uh, if we read the history of the Old Testament, we have to know something about the kind of history writing that was, was done there. For example, if you turn to the history of King Uzziah, you don't really need to do this, but if you were to look at that history of King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26, you would find out that he came to the throne as a young man at the age of 16, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And then we're given a whole list of the things that Uzziah did that was right in the eyes of the Lord. And then we're told of that hideous incident of disobedience on his part where he went into the temple and into the holy place and assumed for himself there in the temple the role of the priest. And for his sacrilege, he was struck with leprosy. 
and he lived out the rest of his life, we are told, in isolation because of his disease, and when he was died, he was buried in a grave that was marked with the epitaph, he was a leper. So what are we inclined to conclude from this reading of the story of Isaiah? I think many of us might be inclined to conclude, well, he started out as a young man doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He did a bunch of good things, and then he went bad, and he died lost. It's pretty grim to have your only epitaph be, he was a leper. But if we interpreted the, that story that way, we would miss the whole point of the way in which the story of the king's is told in the Old Testament because the style of history telling is always in relation to the kings to tell you right at the beginning whether he's a good king or a bad king and then to list his good events and then to list his bad and so because right at the beginning it says Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord we need to know that he was one of the good kings not a perfect king far from it but the final word about Uzziah is not, he was a leper. The final word about Uzziah is, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And so if we don't understand the style, if we don't understand the way of writing, we'll miss, in this case, the whole point of the story. And so it is in looking at other kinds of literature in the Bible. Think about poetry in the Bible. Uh, poetry is a whole... Um, genre that most of us, uh, uh, especially of the male persuasion, are often relatively insensitive to. And yet the Bible abounds in poetry, and poetry is an artful variation on a prose form to create b greater beauty and emotional impact on the reader. But we have to learn how to read poetry, or again we can completely miss the point. If we read uh, Psalm 98, verse 8, and it says, the rivers will clap their hands. Now, what is, what is the Bible teaching us? Well, obviously, it's teaching us that one day rivers will grow arms. Right? Well, now, why are you laughing? Don't you believe in the literal reading of the Bible? Well, no, the minute, the minute we even say that, we recognize, don't we, that, that here is what is known as a figure of speech, an image. It, it's meant to say that all creation is rejoicing before the Lord. And uh, w without maybe being able to label what's going on in the poetry there, we recognize it, that this is not a prophecy of rivers growing arms, but this is a presentation in, in beautiful, evocative language of an image of creation rejoicing before its creator. Now, in English, we know something about what um, uh, poetry is all about. Uh, English poetry very often is driven by meter and rhyme. You can think of some of those short uh, poems of Ogden Nash that illustrate uh, that. Uh, one of my favorites is Ogden Nash's little poem that goes just two lines. How odd of God to choose the Jews. <laughs> or his even shorter poem on ants. Adam had him. <laughs> now you see there's poetry entirely dominated by rhyme and by meter. But in Hebrew poetry, the dominant form is repetition. If we go back to the beginning of Matthew's uh, gospel, to illustrate some of the points I'm going to make, uh, we can look, for example, at the uh, quotation in Matthew chapter 4 from some poetry in Isaiah's prophecy. Um, I referred to it this morning, uh, Matthew 4, 16. L listen to the repetition, the artful variation of a single theme in two uh, different statements. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. That's the first line. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You see, those two lines are saying uh, in many ways the same thing. But they're saying it in a parallel for, uh, way that draws our attention to the poetic character of what is going on here. And so we have uh, the genre of poetry, if you will. Uh, we also have uh, the genre of prophecy. Now, um, uh, prophecy 
is an application of the Word of God, both to present and to future. It's not just a prediction of the future. It's very often an application of what is going to happen in the future to the present of God's people and a call to them uh, to faithfulness. And sometimes in prophecy, we find symbols being used. And uh, sometimes it's perfectly clear that what is intended is to be taken symbolically. Other, other times it may not be so clear. But again, we have to ask uh, a question. What is, what is the character of what's being written down here, and how are we to understand it? For example, in Revelation chapter 5, we have presented to us John's great vision of the heavenly throne room. And we are told that John sees the Lamb upon the throne. One of the great evocative images of the book of Revelation. The Lamb looking as one who had been slain there upon the throne. Now let me ask you a question. When you get to heaven, do you expect to see a throne with a Lamb on it? This isn't a trick question. I think we have to answer no. When we get to heaven, we hope to see Jesus on the throne. So what is John talking about? Is John promoting some kind of polytheism here? No, of course not. We know that Jesus is the lamb who was slain for sinners. And so he's, he's visualizing in words for us the idea of the lamb because the lamb is a symbol of Jesus Christ there in Revelation chapter 5. And as we look closely at that text, I think we would probably agree that almost everything there is a symbol. The four living creatures. Probably there aren't four distinct creatures that are around the throne, but I think those four living creatures represent all created being. And there are 24 elders, probably representing the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles of the church. And there's a, a golden bowl full of incense. Now, Revelation tells us what that symbol means. It's the prayers of the saints ascending before the throne. And so if we want to understand the Bible in the various kinds of its writing, we need to develop a sensitivity to different kinds, to different styles of the way in which the Word of God is given to us. If we flatten it all out, then we end up with rivers growing arms. And we really don't want that. Well, if there are these different kinds of styles of writing, is that the most important issue in trying to approach the Bible and, and understand it and handle it correctly? Actually, I'd like to suggest that there's an even more important and fundamental issue that we need to pause over and think about together. And that's the issue of what it means to interpret the Bible literally. Now, how many people here believe we ought to interpret the Bible literally? What, what is this? We're, we're uncertain about this? This is not a trick question either. Okay, the people with their hands up are orthodox. The rest of you are heretics, but we can, we can try to correct that. Yes, we as, as conservative Protestants have always said, we believe in interpreting the Bible literally. We are committed to that. But what does literal mean, literally? Well, the word literal is derived from the Latin litera. One of the great burdens of the English language is the number of Latin words that have simply been taken over from Latin and plunked down into English as if it means the same thing in English as what it means in Latin. And the problem is that it doesn't always. Uh, one of my favorite categories in the study of historical theology is preventing grace. Now, may, a lot of us may feel that we have preventing grace, and maybe uh, Ahab had preventing grace. Um, well, we, we know what preventing means, doesn't it? It means to stop someone from doing something. But in Latin, the word prevenio means that which comes before. And so prevenient grace really means enabling grace. But somebody didn't do a very good job of translating. Or you needed to know the Latin in order to understand the English. 
Um, it's the way language so easily becomes unclear. At the hotel where I'm staying, there's a, a workout room, and on the, on the door of the workout room, there's a sign. It says, restricted to children under 14 years of age. I read it three times. <laughs> and then I went in and tried to look young. <laughs> Language, you see, sometimes can be a muddle. I'm almost sure that what they meant was, if you were under 14, you couldn't go in. But what they actually said was, if you were over 14, you couldn't go in. But anyway, it's the problem with language. Now we're committed to the literal meaning, but what does literal mean literally? It comes from the Latin litera, which can mean either letters or literature. Our word literature comes from litera in Latin. So you have litera meaning both the basic building blocks of language and communication and the fruit of language in developed writing, letters and literature. So, literal means in its root taking words and understanding the meaning they were intended to convey. Taking words and understanding the meaning they were intended to convey. So what's the literal interpretation of Psalm 98 verse 8, the rivers will clap their hands? The literal interpretation is not that the rivers are going to grow arms. The literal interpretation is that nature rejoices because what the psalmist intended to communicate in writing those words is that nature rejoices. That's the literal meaning of the text. That's the meaning that the words carry. Now to try to understand this literal a little more, we have to look at two opposing points of view. Uh, Sinclair referred uh, to one of them, the spiritualizing point of view, which sees the real meaning of the text below the surface, hidden away. There's a spiritual meaning beneath the surface of the text that we have to find. Uh, one of my favorite examples of that comes from the ancient father of the church, Origen, who wrote a whole sermon on Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 11, beginning with the words, the winter is over. One of the important lessons to learn about reading the Bible is don't read too little at a time. Keep reading. The winter is over. Now what's the literal meaning of the text, the winter is over? The literal meaning is, the winter is over. Uh, this, is, this is a perspicuous verse. But Origen says, what good does it do you to know that? What spiritual profit is there for any of us in the fact that once upon a time, for the writer of the Song of Songs, the winter was over? Well, there must be spiritual depths hidden away here that somehow we've missed. The winter is over. I've been converted. The winter of my sins is past. Origen suggests that as one interpretation. The winter of the Old Testament is over. The new covenant has come. The winter of the tri trials of this present world will soon end and the new heaven and the earth will come. Now that's much more spiritually profitable, isn't it? It's also all true, isn't it? it the only slight liability is it actually has no relation to this text. That's the danger with the spiritualizing of a text. But before we laugh too hard at origin, we have to recognize that we're often tempted to do that. Think of uh, that famous uh, verse in Psalm uh, 121, verse 1. Unto the hills around I lift my longing eyes from, oh, whence for me does my salvation come? From whence arise? That's the metrical form. Well, what's happening there in that psalm. Presumably the psalmist is about to set out for his pilgrimage to Jerusalem to worship God. And at the beginning of these songs of ascents, he looks around and up ahead of him he sees mountains he has to climb over and he wonders where is he going to get the energy to climb over the mountains. 
That's the literal meaning of the text. He was about to begin a journey and there were obstacles, hazards in this journey, and he needed help. But how often do we in our traditions say, and so what are your spiritual mountains that you have to climb over? Now what's happened there? We've taken a shortcut through spiritualization to an edifying use of the text. How is it edifying for us that, that some psalmist 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, climbed over a mountain? But you see, if we turn that mountain into a spiritual difficulty that you face, then that text becomes spiritually profitable, you see. Again, the danger is that we miss altogether what the text is really intended to be about. We also live in a time where there's an even more radical spiritualization of language that says language ultimately doesn't really have either a literal meaning or a spiritual meaning. It has no meaning at all. Texts mean only what you make them mean for yourself. This is what has come to be called deconstructionism. And that's part of why we can have a million different forms of Christianity or here this afternoon, 4,000 different forms of Christianity. It just means to you what it means to you. And isn't that great? No, it's not great. It implies that God, the creator of the world, and the creator of languages and mouths and ears and minds is unable to communicate with his creatures. Is that likely? No. The God who made us has always been able to communicate with us. It always strikes me when I think about God meeting Moses at the, the burning bush. Moses was immediately aware that he was in the presence of the divine. He wasn't uncertain about what was God was saying to him. He wasn't uncertain about the meaning of God's words. He understood God could communicate. God still communicates. And so we want to avoid on the one hand any kind of spiritualizing of the text that seeks the real meaning of the text below the surface of the text and misses the literal meaning. We want the literal meaning of the text. But on the other hand, there is in our day a danger that may even be more severe for some of us to a kind of hyper-literalism that having rejected a spiritualizing approach to the text, we then want to be so rigidly literal that we also miss the meaning of the text. Now, there are a lot of people here a lot smarter than I am, and I don't know if there is already extant a label for this rigid form of literalism. I'm not aware of one. There's probably some ancient Gallic term that could be uh, uh, drawn to mind, something like proleptic. Um, but um, I don't know what to call it. it is it hyper-literal? Is it pseudo-literal? Is it wooden? Is it mechanical? Well, just to be slightly insulting, I've come up with a, a label for it myself. And I think it ought to be called the illiterate reading of the text. Now you see, that's literally correct. It's a reading of the text that doesn't understand either the letters or the language. It's the reading of the text that would suggest that you're not faithful to the Word of God if you don't think rivers won't grow arms. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that sometimes we're tempted to this illiterate or hyper-literal reading of the text. Jesus' disciples were. There's a great case of it in Matthew. Chapter 16, verse 5, Jesus said to the disciples, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Sadducees and Pharisees. And the disciples said to one another, Why is he talking about bread? This was not a clever group. <laughs> they might have been helped by seminary, but you can't be sure. Sure. 
So Matthew explains for us, because so often we're not any better than the disciples, Matthew 16, verse 12, then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Oh, yeast stood for teaching. Now you see, an illiterate doesn't understand when figures of speech are being used. Uh, Jesus, I think, probably technically here is using a metonymy, right, R.C.? Now, one of the great things about analyzing figures of speech is that you end up with a whole list of words impossible to remember or to remember their definition, but it's a very helpful classification system. A metonymy is where you use the attribute of, of uh, uh, one thing to represent another. So what is the character of yeast that it gets in and changes? what was present. And that's the character, you see, of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees that Jesus was trying to highlight. Doesn't matter whether you know the word metonymy or not, but you see immediately, Jesus isn't talking about bread. He's talking about teaching. And you miss the whole point if you become illiterate and think he's talking about bread. We have to be on guard against that kind of wooden reading of the scripture. Because it's not just that illiteracy reveals you to be ignorant, it's all good for us to have to face our ignorance once in a while. It's that illiteracy can be exceedingly dangerous to the life of the church. Consider Isaiah 59, verse 16. It is a verse about God in which we read, His own arm worked salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. His own arm worked salvation for him. There may be well Mormons who will quote this verse and say, you see, God has a body. Oh, no, he doesn't. This is a figure of speech. Ha! You just don't believe the Bible. It says right there, God has an arm. And you're nothing but a liberal changing that arm into a symbol and a figure of speech. Well, what do we say? You say, you're illiterate. <laughs> you don't understand the function of language. You don't understand the real meaning of literal. We understand when we look at the Bible as a whole that the Bible testifies God is a spirit. And therefore we know that when an anthropomorphism, a, a figure derived from human reality is applied to God, it's applied that way as a figure of speech, not as a literal declaration that God is physical. But in the case of Mormonism, we can see how disastrous it is to take this illiterate approach, this hyper-literal approach to reading the Bible. And so we have to cultivate a sensitivity, you see, to language. It comes automatically to most of us in all sorts of places. Let me give you some examples from Matthew. Chapter 2, uh, verse 3. No, that's not right. Anyway, it's where John the Baptist in chapter 3 turns to the uh, Pharisees. It's uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 7, and says to them, You brood of vipers. Now, had John just performed a miracle there and turned the Pharisees into snakes? No, you see, w w without almost ref any reflection on it, we immediately recognize that he's using a, a form of speech to criticize them. He's comparing them to, to, to venomous, dangerous, deadly, writhing snakes. They aren't actually snakes, but they act like snakes. It's a metaphor. Now, that's an easy one. Sometimes they're more difficult. When Joel's prophecy says that in the last day the moon will turn to blood, is that a figure of speech? Will the moon actually become blood, or will it just come to look like blood? You see, there are important questions along the line here. I think it is a metaphor. We have in Matthew 3.16 a, a, a simile. 
The Spirit of God descended like a dove. It's interesting now we see doves in lots of places representing the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit descended and he was a dove. It says he descended like a dove. Well, in what way was he like a dove? Text doesn't make abundantly clear, but I suspect it was not that he descended with feathers. Even though Luther, in one of his best statements, criticized Thomas Munzer, who claimed to have the Holy Spirit, by saying Munzer thinks he's swallowed the Holy Ghost feathers and all. <laughs> but I suspect the like of the dove meant that in some sense something visible had landed like a bird on Jesus. But it wasn't a bird. It, this is a figure of speech. Now, one of my own favorites is synecdoche. These words are just wonderful, aren't they? Almost totally useless, but very pleasant on the ear. So it reminds me of a teacher that my wife had once in high school English who said he always wanted to have a daughter and name her diarrhea. He thought that was such a euphonious word, uh, but his wife had never gone along. Okay, this is a synecdoche. It means a part standing for the whole. Uh, Matthew 3, verse 3, there was a voice crying in the wilderness. Just the voice, no body, no mouth, no tongue. Now see, again, immediately we recognize that it, we don't immediately recognize it's a synecdoche, but we understand that a part is standing for all the whole, and that the part being focused on is, is critical. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, we know we're not praying that we would only have bread to eat, but it's a synecdoche. We're praying for something that stands for the whole. Okay, most of these, as I say, are, are readily apparent, but then we move into an area that's a little more difficult. Um, because one of the figures of speech is called hyperbole, which means deliberate exaggeration. Matthew 2, verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, is Matthew saying that every living individual in Jerusalem was as disturbed as Herod was about the news of the visit of the Magi? That's possible, but somewhat unlikely. Probably what's happening here is a deliberate exaggeration that says Herod was disturbed and many people in the city were disturbed with it. This isn't a mistake if we conclude that not every individual in Jerusalem was disturbed. It's a recognition of the way that language works. We have a, a parallel in um, Mark 1 verse 4 where we read about John baptizing in the Jordan and the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Well, if we don't see an exaggeration there, then we create a contradiction in the Bible because we know that the Pharisees refused to be baptized with the baptism of John. So once again, this is, this is hyperbole. This is deliberate exaggeration, and what it's intended to say is masses of people went out to John from Judea and Jerusalem. Huge crowds of people went out to him. And again, we don't want an illiterate meaning of the text. You still with me? I hope at some point to offend each and every one of you. There are anthropomorphisms in the text. There is a voice from heaven. What does that mean? Well, it means God has a vocal cord. No. Now, I want to be clear about this. I believe they heard a voice. There was a voice that they recognized as a voice from heaven. But it wasn't God's throat that was producing a voice. It was God producing a voice that would speak to the ears that he had created. This is really not a statement about God, but of God's accommodating and communicating himself to us. Now, as I say, these are fairly easy cases. In the remaining minutes, let's, let's have some fun with some tough cases. You understand, professors have a very perverse notion of fun. <laughs> what is the literal meaning of the words, this is my body? You know, it was not President Clinton who first asked what the meaning of is is. 
It was evangelicals who, with any other text, tell you that they believe the literal meaning, but can't talk fast enough about how is in this sentence doesn't mean is. And I was uh, uh, charmed by um, uh, Dr. Lutzer's uh, quotation of Dr. Unger that when um, the premillennials get to heaven, if they're wrong, they'll say, Lord, you'll have to forgive us for naively believing what you said. Because that's almost exactly what Luther said to Zwingli in a debate. Luther, of course, was a little sharper. He said, when we get to heaven, we'll say to the Lord, there has arisen a little dispute over the meaning of the words, this is my body. We have accepted them simply as they stand. No reformed person will ever be able to say that to God. What's the meaning of is? What's the literal meaning? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I do have ideas, but it would take me a very long time. The, the point is this. We cannot view literal interpretation as a way to solve every problem of biblical interpretation. And people who tell you the meaning of this is obvious from the literal meaning of the text should be watched. They may often be right, but they may also be wrong. And we don't want workmen who will just come along and say this is obvious, that is obvious, the other thing is obvious and then appeal to the literal meaning of the text and if you don't agree with their interpretation you don't believe in the literal meaning that's fighting dirty it's not fair and it's not right there are very legitimate debates that go on about the meaning of this is my body and Lutherans and Reformed are equally committed to a literal reading of the text it doesn't solve the problem of interpretation there's been a lot of debate in conservative Protestant circles of late about creation. I promised to offend all of you before I was done. And I don't want to get into uh, many of the, uh, the issues that have been debated, but let me again just illustrate something of the problem for you, not with I think a familiar illustration from Genesis 1, but one that I hope will get us all thinking. Genesis 1-3 we read, and God said, let there be light. What does it mean in that context, God said? Now when there are human beings around to hear God speaking, we know what it means for God to say. It means he has accommodated himself to us and to our ears and to our hearing so that we can hear God speak. But when there are no human beings around, what does it mean that God said? Oh, I know, it means angels have ears. Now that was better than, come on, a little laughter. Angels don't have ears, they're spirit beings. However God and the angels communicate, it's not through voice and ears. Those are physical realities. The sound of the voice is, is projected in a physical way. I have no idea how, but I've, been, I've read that somewhere. It, it, it's sound waves. It's a physical reality. Angels don't need that, God doesn't need that. Oh, I get it. So Genesis 1-3 proves that God has a body. No, that's not the good solution either. What does it mean? It means that God in Genesis 1 is revealing himself to us in the capacity and in the terms that we can understand. So does that make Genesis 1 verse 3 untrue? Of course not. But it means that we ought to at least pause when we read Genesis 1 and ask ourselves some searching questions about what that text is actually teaching us. And when it says, and God said, let there be light and there was light, what it is teaching us is that God by an act of his will, we won't get into whether he has a will, he does, by his own act of power has brought light into being. But there are things going on in that text which just saying, I hold to the literal meaning of the text, doesn't solve. The question is, what meaning are the words intended to convey?
if I could see what time it was, I might stop, but I can't. Um, one, 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 last, uh, one last example. And, and this is particularly important to people who talk so confidently about the plain meaning of the text. In Matthew 1, we are told there are 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the exile, 14 generations from the exile to Christ. Now, do you know what 14 is? Do you know literally what 14 is? Of course you do. Do you know what a generation is? Do you know literally what a generation is? Of course you do. Matthew seems to hang all of his point in the genealogy on three groupings of 14 generations. But if you count the names in the third grouping, there are only 13. And if you compare Matthew's genealogy with Luke's, you find that in some of the um, groups there are more names in Luke than there are in Matthew, implying that there are more generations than 14. So what is the literal meaning of Matthew's text? That there were 14, as we literally know what 14 means, generations, as we literally know what 14 means, if that's what you believe, you have succeeded in creating an error in the Bible, which is, I think, not what we want to do. Although it might appear at a first glance that nothing could be more clear than the literal meaning of 14 generations in Matthew 1, by taking a second and a third glance, we discover something else has to be going on there. Matthew is taking history, not, I think, to tell us there were literally, in the old use of the word, 14 generations from one point to another, but to say the great epochs in Israel's history are Abraham, David, exile, Christ. And we could get into some more of the details here, but we won't pause there. It's just to say there are things in Scripture, if we don't want to be ashamed and look ridiculous and illiterate in our interpretation of, we have to pause and think carefully about. And that's why the most critical thing I want to say to you, and I've left just a moment to say it in, is that while there is a war on the Word, and we are called to be combatants in the defense of that Word, let us be sure that we always speak the truth in love. Dr. MacArthur talked last night about the disappointments and the dangers of friendly fire, and that's a very important point. Let's not too quickly accuse people with whom we have disagreements about the interpretation of the word that they have been faithless to a literal commitment to the word. Now, some people are faithless to a literal commitment to the Word. But I suspect if we did a survey here, we'd find a lot of differences. I believe probably everyone here is committed to the literal interpretation of the Bible. I believe everyone here is committed to the inerrancy of Scripture. I believe everyone here thinks that they're Reformed, even if they're not Dutch. But you know, we are probably divided about baptism. And we're probably divided about the millennium. And we may be divided about creation. And we're probably divided about whether we ought to sing psalms alone or may also sing hymns. There are probably a lot of other things. We're divided about whether to be Presbyterian or congregational. Does that mean that we're not really literalists or that we're not really inerrantists? Oh, what it reminds us is that there are other issues for the interpretation of the Bible than just whether we're literal or not. And as we approach those issues, some of them very precious to us, let's do it in love. Let's be militant and accurate. Let's be zealous and careful. Let's promote truth and righteousness, but also promote humility and love. And I believe if we will do that, then we'll really adorn our doctrine in a way that honors our Christ. Let's be like the noble-minded Bereans, who when they wanted to check out something, didn't berate Paul, 
didn't create a kind of shouting religion the way we have shout politics on Crossfire and all those somewhat entertaining programs until you get a headache. But let's search the scriptures carefully, thoughtfully, as literate as well as literal minded people that we might find what God is really saying in his word because that should be our great desire. Let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, we are thankful for your word and we are mindful that you at many places in it speak to us in figures. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we might have the diligence and the wisdom to study that word, to search the scriptures, and to understand what you are saying to us. Make us humble, O oh Lord, before the word and before each other and fill us with love in the way in which we study your word so that that fruit of your spirit might be abundantly manifest in us as we communicate with one another and with the world. Hear us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.